Hello. Uh, I'm going to be reading to you today some of uh, some more of the story we've been looking at, which is the uh, Bear Grylls Mission Survive. Uh, looking forward to that. But before I do, I've got here a note, an email, in fact, from one of the girls in my class. And she sent me some extra information on the Inuits, which were mentioned in the story. So I thought I'd share those with you, um, direct from uh, clapwoodhomelearning at gmail.com. Thank you for that. Uh, so she said that the Inuit people lived in the far northern areas of Alaska and Canada, Siberia and Greenland. They lived in a cold and bleak climate. Their homes were made of snow and ice in the winter and of animal skins and bones in the summer. The Inuit word for home is igloo. They used animal skins such as caribou and seal skin and fur to stay warm. They lined their clothes with fur from polar bears, rabbits and foxes. They ate meat from hunting animals. They used harpoons to hunt seals, walruses and whales, and they ate fish and hunted for wild berries. An interesting fact is a member of its people is called an Inuk. It might be an Inuk, I'm not sure on the pronunciation. So thank you very much for that, that's great. So um, anything else anyone learns about uh, the Inuit people, let me know. But in the meantime, I've got uh, the next chapter from the story that I wanted to share with you today. And it gets a little bleak in chapter 3. Just a fair warning. Two years ago, surveyors from the oil giant Lumos Petroleum had learned that Anakat sat a slap bang on top of a huge untapped oil field. There had been a village meeting to discuss the matter, of course, to discuss what to do when a multinational oil corporation wants to buy your ancestral land, destroy your way of life and relocate you, and sweetens the pill by offering every man, woman and child a brand new home with all modern amenities and enough money in the bank to buy all the iPods you could ever want. Beck knew that Takani, for one, was all in favour of it. He couldn't wait to be relocated among the adults of Anakat. The matter wasn't so clear-cut. Well, even the money Lumos was offering didn't mean a lot to people. They never wanted that much money in the first place. It was that oral tradition again, you know. They knew uh, what they could lose from their way of life. Their stories that passed on from father to son, from mother to daughter, were priceless. In a way that Lumos's accountants could, could never understand. And so Uncle Al was flying up to film a TV documentary about the village and the traditional Anak way of life. If it all changed, at least there'd be some record of it. Even better, the program would make more people aware of what was going on. But suddenly, there was a huge bang. The plane lurched. Beck clutched the armrest of his seat. The plane stabilised again. The engine was running smoothly. Takani was sitting bolt upright, staring ahead, his face pale. Peck forced a smile. Wow. They must have hit an air pocket around, and wow. For a moment, even Beck had thought, the engine stuttered. And the plane shook. And then Beck realised that a trail of dark smoke was streaming past his window. It was coming from the engine. It grew thicker as he watched through an innocuous wisp to an evil cloud in the freezing air outside. And now, the claim was very quickly banking to one side. It steadied again, but Beck could feel his insides lurching. The plane was dropping and fast. Something's blown. The pilot's calm tones in the earphones had gone, replaced with professional crispness. Oil feed's not getting through. Edge attempts way up. I'm going to put the nose down and hope the air cools her enough to restart. Hope. Beck wanted to scream. With the plane plummeting out of the sky, he could do little more than concentrate on that. The static went away, and all that was left in Beck's ears was the roaring of his blood. The engine had stopped. No noise. No vibration. He pulled off the earphones. Air rushed past the hull. All he could see through the front windows was ground. Beck could hear the pilot's calm, urgent tone. Mayday, 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 Anchorage, this is Golf Mike Oscar. Beck? Beck barely heard. He was staring at the approaching trees. This must have been what it was like. Beck! Uncle Al had turned in his seat again, and his shout broke into Beck's reverie. And you too, Takani. Takani was staring ahead as well, like a mesmerised rabbit. Al had to click his fingers in front of the boy's face to get his attention. 
Both of you, you know the emergency position. Adopt it now. Beck and Takani glanced at each other, and then without a word, they bent over double in their seat, arms wrapped around their heads, and they waited. Beck had no idea what was going through Takani's head, but his own thoughts were running away with him. This must have been what it was like, Mum and Dad. Three years earlier, they'd been in a plane like this. It crashed in the jungle, and the chain, the, the plane, had been found. But, but they are not. They were presumed dead. It never occurred to, to Beck until now that a plane crash is an instant. Something falling out of the sky takes time to reach the ground, and all you can do if you're on it is wait and try hard not to picture the ground approaching fast. The engine roared into life again, and the pilot pulled back on the column. A mighty force pressed back into the back of his seat as the plane lifted, and Akani shouted in triumph. Beck felt the plane levelling off and lifted his head just in time to see the trees rise up in front of the plane and smash into them. I will leave it there. I'll be back next week with uh, chapter four. I hope you're enjoying it. I wonder what's going to happen next. I'll see you next time.